Hello and welcome to today's Learn at Lunchtime program from the State Museum of Pennsylvania. I am Beth Erickson. Our topic today is historical archaeology and the search for early Philadelphia potter Branch Green. With us is Paul Nasca, Senior Curator of Archaeology with the State Museum of Pennsylvania. Hello, Paul, and thank you for being part of today's program. So tell us about yourself and what you do at the State Museum of Pennsylvania. Well, my role uh, here is uh, I'm the Senior Curator of Archaeology. Um, I oversee a talented team of eight other curators who care for the Commonwealth's archaeological resources, and that is both stewardship, um, uh, managing them, uh, overseeing them, as well as the interpretation of those resources. So it's a, it's a big job, uh, but I got a great team behind me. Sounds wonderful. Archaeology is a general term that encompasses, encompasses many specialty disciplines within a diverse field. Tell us what makes historical archaeology unique. Unique. I could sort of sum it up in two words, and that it's a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, that okay. um, archaeology pulls on a whole bunch of different disciplines, and I'm going to touch on that a little bit today in my program. Well, let's get started with today's program to find out more. So, Paul, when you are ready, you can begin. Today's program um, is going to be a bit of a whirlwind tour uh, in just the few minutes that we have today. Um, and I'm going to begin um, by talking about historical archaeology and uh, just uh, what that is and how it fits into the sciences, as well as um, look at a few different types of archaeology um, specialties within the field of historical archaeology. And then at the very end, I'm going to touch on uh, a stoneware potter whose name is Branch Green, an unusual name. Um, Branch Green, um, I uh, became interested in Branch Green uh, as he was Delaware's first stoneware potter. And I am brand new here to the state, uh, state of Pennsylvania, that is, uh, as the senior curator. I was previously the uh, state curator of archaeology for the state of Delaware uh, just a few months ago. Um, but Branch Green spends the majority of his potting career in the city of Philadelphia. Um, so I'm going to take a peek at a little bit uh, about um, the museum collections here that have holdings from Branch Green, as well as um, some preliminary research. And I'm, I want to stress preliminary uh, at this point. So let's get started. So working at the museum, I am often asked by our younger staff, um, not our staff, but our younger visitors, uh, I often ask them, what is archaeology? Uh, and inevitably, um, it involves dinosaurs at some point. But in fact, that is not the case. Um, my two sons think it is uh, uh, dinosaurs as well, uh, as much as I try. But uh, in fact, we leave that to my colleagues, the paleontologists, to deal with. But what is archaeology? It's uh, in and of itself. So archaeology is the scientific study of cultures and people and their behavior through the analysis of the material remains that they left behind. What do I mean by material remains? What material remains uh, tend to be um, that archaeologists refer to them as artifacts, sort of these um, durable objects that preserve in the ground uh, 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 throughout time. Um, and stoneware that we'll be talking about from Branch Green is one of those objects. So um, there's other types of material that does not preserve in the ground that archaeologists can also recover. And we call those archaeological features. They're sort of artifacts or products of human activity that we actually can't pick up and carry into the, uh, into the lab, but are, are uh, just as important uh, as well. So let's move on. Archaeology is anthropology. We fall within the field of anthropology. And what the field of anthropology addresses is the study of people. And there tends to be four fields of anthropology. Physical anthropology, which uh, examines human evolution. Um, cultural anthropology, which is non-Western groups of people studying their culture. Linguistics, that wonderful thing of language that is unique to so many cultures. Uh, and of course, archaeology, the tangible remains uh, of the past that are still uh, recoverable. So archaeologists are very concerned with time. Um, and historical archaeologists are concerned with a very short 
period of time if we consider human the, pre the human presence, human occupation in what is today what we call Pennsylvania. So um, there is a long, long and deep rich history uh, of uh, the past here in the lands of Pennsylvania. And those ancestral homes were home to Native Americans. And we we say it goes back as far as 16,000 years, 14 to 16,000 years. There's a site here called Meadowcroft Rock Shelter um, that has some very, very early dates uh, for the peopling of America here. So there is this deep, rich history. If you could see my cursor, it's, uh, this is not to scale, but if this was uh, thousands of years, we get to a point um, at AD 1492. And if that sort of rings a bell, um, it's because of it's the contact of Columbus uh, into the New World. Was there prior contact? There could have been. Um, there's been some research about uh, uh, further uh, north sort of Scandinavian cultures coming down, but we sort of stick with 1492 as that initial contact down in the Caribbean. <clears throat> It's going to be a little while before contact happens here in Pennsylvania. Uh, it's going to be into the 1620s, 1630s, but it's this period here that is a tricky little period. Um, and it begins this period of historic archaeology. Um, certainly by the time that William Penn receives his charter in 1681, uh, the Pennsylvania colony uh, is well underway. And historical archaeology is concerned pretty much right up to almost the current day. So uh, I often will say that today is tomorrow's past. So we are always uh, creating um, the next chapter of archeological history. And we'll know that um, um, archeology span is, even though we're looking back through historical archeology, span three, 400 years, um, many of the things that we see are not very different uh, than today. So uh, problems and situations and human behaviors, um, uh, folks back then are not much different than folks uh, today. So I just wanna to touch upon this little, this period that archeologists call the contact period. And it, it, it really brings about globalization. And that's something we hear about today. And it's a very tumultuous period uh, for the two cultures that come together, European cultures and Native American cultures. Uh, so it really brings about this whole new world, this culture change um, with this European contact. It marks a period of catastrophic change for Native Americans because European diseases rapidly uh, reduce Native populations. So uh, there's just no immunity to these, Euro these European diseases. Uh, settlement in the Delaware Valley, uh, sort of on the eastern and of the state of Pennsylvania is settled by multiple cultures, multiple European nations, the Swedes, the Finns, the Dutch, and the English. And this period is a tumultuous period as well for them, these European uh, uh, nations. They're, they're vying for control. And this starts in the late 1620s. And by the time the English sorted all out, it's sort of the mid 1660s. So it creates competition. It creates competition amongst these European cultures uh, for uh, 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 natural resources here, particularly furs to be exported uh, back to Europe uh, for manufacture and to goods. And it also creates a competition amongst the Native Americans for European goods. And this competition really disrupts Native lifeways um, with this introduction uh, of European goods. And much of this period, this contact period, what uh, archeologists call a contact period, um, uh, is really only accessible. Most of it is only accessible uh, through the process uh, of archeology. span As this period fades, uh, native cultures um, are pretty much um, uh, in a shambles. Um, either they are uh, leave the state um, or are assimilated into a European uh, society. Um, so it's a very tragic period um, for this uh, definite uh, culture collapse of the native population. Does the native population ever disappear? No, it does not. Um, in fact, uh, the, our native population is still with us today, even though there are no uh, federally recognized tribes uh, that remain here in the state. Certainly there's a presence, a Native American presence here uh, with us still today. 
So let's talk about what makes historical archaeology unique. Uh, and if we could sum it up in one sort of piece of it right here, it's the use of primary documents to help us interpret the past. And what's a primary document? It could be anything that's generated by the folks that we're hoping to study. It may be a map, a drawing, perhaps a painting. It could be photographs, diaries, and letters. We also see tax records, court documents, census records, certainly the newspaper, um, as well as muster rolls for soldiers, and many, many, many more forms uh, of documentation. And this primary documentation helps inform uh, archaeologists, particularly historical archaeologists, uh, when looking at uh, particular peoples uh, from this time period. So um, it's really the support of this other, um, this other branch of evidence um, that helps uh, become a much fuller uh, interpretation uh, of the past. So how is archaeology unique in that it gives voice to the underrepresented or forgotten in most of the historic documentation. And who might that be? That could be the enslaved populations. Um, there were enslaved here in the state of Pennsylvania uh, by the 1780s. Um, there's a, um, a, 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 it's not really a law, but a, a, um, a motion is passed to slowly reduce uh, slavery uh, here in the state. By about the turn of the 19th century, about half of those folks uh, pretty much from about 1780 to about 1800, uh, approximately half of the enslaved held in the state um, um, uh, are not there anymore. Uh, but it will take all the way until about 1840, 1850 before the last of the enslaved folks in the state of Pennsylvania um, are freed. So uh, who else is underrepresented or forgotten uh, often in the historic record? And that's women. Um, could also be immigrants and minorities, as well as the working class. Um, I use this image on the right uh, of the, the gentleman with the four, <laughs> with the four boys uh, sitting there. Uh, I actually use it in two slides. It's one of the only images that I repeat in my presentation today. Um, having two little boys, <laughs> just like what's sitting on that gentleman's lap right there, I can only think of the hardships um, that that family's endured. I often ask, where is mom in this image? a powerful image. So how is a historical archaeology unique? And another way is that it provides insight into human behavior and environmental change. What does that mean? We could look at foodways that are often not captured in um, documentation. We could look at environmental change and human adaptation to that environmental change. What does overfishing do? Um, what does um, what pollution do to the waterways and how do people adapt to it? What other food resources do they begin to depend on? We could also view health and hygiene. How are people caring for themselves and their bodies um, through time? Bathing is a, um, a, a, not a very common practice in the 18th century and it gains traction by the 19th and certainly by the 20th century. We could also begin to look at illicit activities uh, that happen in society, alcohol consumption, prostitution, drug use. All of this is viewable through the lens uh, of archeology span that often doesn't make it into the historic record. So how do we pull it all together? Historical archeology span is a multidisciplinary approach. I already said that. I sometimes think about it as running the bases in archaeology when we look at an archaeological site. Archaeology and anthropology are the people. And if we're working with historical archaeology, I always sort of consider that first base. History and the arts and the documentation, which is documentation, we often get to first base. It's harder to get around the other bases. So um, if we're able to pull in more um, careful studies, biological sciences, where we begin to look at plants and animals and the environment and the archaeological record at a particular site, um, we've advanced further. And then if we can even get more, the physical sciences, chemistry, pedology, and geology, we can go all the way, come back, sliding into home plate to touch the people again of the past. So 
we're not always a home run, but certainly um, most times historical archaeology at least gets a good hit to first base. And there's Jim Thorpe over there on the right. Uh, Jim Thorpe, uh, famous uh, ball player here in the state of Pennsylvania. I believe he played for Carlisle in college. He's a Native American, uh, and he's interred here in the state of Pennsylvania. So, but archaeology's archaeologists business is artifacts it's there are another primary resource much like historic documentations here's a group of tavern wares from the mid to late 18th century all of these wares were chosen um, available brought in imported most of them um, purchased um, they express perhaps a level of uh, refinement uh, express a level of conscious behavior to purchase them. Also, the types of um, uh, stemware that someone might be drinking a, a beverage from, uh, the types of um, drinks that are served in these wares. And so these are all conscious decisions that are made uh, in the acquisition of, of these products. And we make these conscious decisions all the time in our life today. So if we think about it, we can think about our particular tribe that we perhaps root for, <laughs> our particular sports teams. Um, we all put on a face every day from the clothes we wear to the cars we drive, to the phones that we keep in our pocket, to the houses that we purchase. Um, it's all a way of communication and making conscious decisions about who we want to be and how we want to express ourselves. And this is what archaeologists look for through the archaeological artifact record. I can't think of a more poignant artifact. If I could sum up archaeology in one artifact, it is this button right here, a USA button excavated at Valley Forge at a time when the United States was not even the United States. I was a young graduate student sitting in a lecture um, at a conference and uh, a, a prominent archaeologist, Dr. David Orr, showed a picture of this, not this particular button, but another USA button. And he opened up a whole world to me of understanding the idea of the power of an object to communicate who you are, what you are, your belief, even before you were even a nation, the intertwining. Pennsylvania is the keystone state that binds the colonies together. We are the USA. And that one object, to me, sums it all up. So I want to talk a bit about some specialty fields in the history uh, uh, in, in archaeology. So different areas of research. And one of those is maritime archaeology. When I speak of maritime archaeology, um, I'm talking mostly, um, obviously, seagoing. And Philadelphia, being a major seaport, um, was um, an incredibly important place. And all of this traffic is traveling. This All of this Atlantic traffic, this connection to the world, is traveling up and down the Delaware. These collections are actually in... Um, the state of Delaware. And there are two shipwreck collections. Uh, I know them well, like I said, because I was with um, the state of Delaware prior here, but I just wanted to bring them up because both of these have a relation to Philadelphia. The first is the Roosevelt Inlet shipwreck, which was first interpreted to be the Severn, a British ship that sank uh, in the 1780s, a later 1780s. But a re-examination of the artifacts uh, by one of my colleagues in Delaware uh, put forth a theory that, in fact, this is not the Severn, but in fact, a Dutch vessel. And looking closer at the ceramic wares that were contained in this collection, we actually believe that this is a ship called the Maria Johanna, a ship that uh, came into the Delaware Bay in the winter of 1783 and 84 and actually got crushed by the ice. This was a Dutch vessel inbound with a cargo, mostly of Geneva, gin, uh, on board. Uh, bound for Philadelphia with a cargo of also uh, related ceramics. Um, this vessel obviously never made it to its destination uh, in Philadelphia. Also connected to that Atlantic world is another wreck, the HMS de Brock, 
a brig sloop of about 85 feet. Um, the DeBrock was on convoy service in the late 1790s at a time after the American Revolution when, um, when the young United States was at a very uh, uh, critical point uh, in trade. And this trade, um, we are dependent. We were 13 colonies dependent on Europe. Um, now that we won our independence, um, domestic manufacture was lacking and we were still desperately um, dependent on European imported goods. However, England and France are at war at this period. Liberty spills out of America and spills into France. Um, and quickly, um, England and France uh, go to war. So American shipping is um, being harassed on the high seas and seized. So de Brock is on convoy service escorting 44 merchantmen to the mouth of the Delaware Bay, of which about half of that group, um, some of that group, not, uh, uh, not all, about half, um, some of that half go on to Philadelphia where the remainder uh, were headed to the Chesapeake. Um, de Brock was supposed to escort that group uh, to the Chesapeake, but in fact, um, she takes on water. Um, uh, she goes into Lewis, Delaware to take on drinking water, but is caught by a squall and literally blows over and sinks. So here's that connection, that Atlantic world connection uh, that um, Pennsylvania uh, is uh, participating in. Uh, in this early time period. Um, some in interesting objects. Um, we often, uh, this particular uh, plate here uh, has an etching uh, on the back. Um, uh, very unusual um, sort of spirit spirituality um, is the interpretation of these. Uh, prior curator from Delaware, uh, Chuck Fithian, uh, looked at these very closely. Um, and um, indeed, uh, these are a, a unique set of wares uh, on the Dubrock. There's several of these uh, plates that um, have these uh, peculiar etchings on them. So let's look, oops, excuse me. Let's look at another type of um, historic site specialty and that's military sites archeology. span uh, Pennsylvania is rich in military sites archeology span I already mentioned Valley Forge. Um, camp security, um, a Revolutionary War um, prisoner of war camp. And then there is, of course, this whole string of frontier fortifications um, in the 1750s during the French and Indian period, the French and Indian Wars, where England and France um, are in conflict uh, on the frontier. Um, and there's a series of forts that um, create that boundary uh, between frontier uh, and settlement. And one of them is close by here to Harrisburg, Fort Hunter. And there has been a, a long uh, series of excavations going on uh, at Fort Hunter. Um, it is a, 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 a county park today. Um, you can see the historic documentation here from my cursor shows up. Uh, the fort uh, at Hunter's here is right at this confluence of a small creek uh, as well as the Susquehanna here. This is a great ar uh, community archaeology program. Uh, archaeology, uh, community archaeology, is one of the um, one of the great benefits uh, of archaeology. Reaching out and connecting a community, a living community, with its past and its heritage. Um, uh, Fort Hunter is a great example of this community outreach. Um, I spent several years at Alexandria Archaeology in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, I couldn't think of a better group of folks uh, who know community archaeology well, uh, and that's those folks down in Alexandria. A way to connect the living, the present, with the past. Historical archaeology also can look at industrial sites. Here is a large um, ongoing project uh, undertaken by AECOM. This is a large contract archaeology firm uh, who is working with the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation with uh, clearing uh, archaeological areas ahead of uh, redevelopment and rehabilitation of the I-95 corridor. And it's called Digging I-95. Here's one industrial site that um, they encountered, uh, the Dietville Glassworks, um, uh, large glassworks in, <clears throat> in operation in the uh, certainly by in the 1820s. <clears throat> um, 
this glass uh, flask that you see uh, pictured here at the bottom um, has, in fact, on one side, Ben Franklin, and uh, on the other, um, uh, Dr. Diet himself, the owner of the glass works, a clever ploy, a clever marketing ploy uh, to uh, help sell his wares. He's associating himself with some of Philadelphia's, uh, with one of Philadelphia's greatest founding fathers, um, Ben Franklin. This uh, flask is currently on display as part of our uh, Franklin 300 exhibit here at the State Museum. So if you're in, be sure to look for uh, this flask uh, on display on the ground floor. So I'm gonna take a look. We went from craft industrial sites production. I'm gonna take a quick peek at historic archeology span of craft production. I'm gonna particularly focus on this Potter Branch Green. Like I mentioned earlier, Branch Green is a, um, uh, was Delaware's first stoneware potter, but, but by the time he gets to Delaware, uh, he's at the end of his career. Um, so uh, a quick, what do we know about Branch Green? I'll be quite honest, we don't know much. Um, we know uh, a bit about, um, about how he moves, but we don't know his wares particularly well. We do know his Philadelphia, I would argue we, we do know his Philadelphia wares uh, fairly well. But um, just to sort of run down the bullet list here of sort of the, the career, the life and career of Branch Green. He's born in 1774 in Norwich, Connecticut. Norwich is a large potting community. Uh, he's married for the first time uh, in 1794. And by 1798, he's uh, in Troy, New York potting. Uh, by 1803, he's left Troy and is working in Old Bridge or South, uh, South Bridge, New Jersey. <clears throat> and he marries his second wife at that time. By about 1808, 1809, he's in Philadelphia. And again, this is a, 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 an early period leading up right up to the War of 1812 here, where there will be an embargo um, where uh, European manufactured goods will not be coming into, uh, into the colonies. Um, but by 18, so he, he, he pots a long time here in Philadelphia, and by 27, he sells his pottery works, um, and he begins to show up in Wilmington at this time. 1827, he's um, uh, 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 attending temperance society uh, meetings, and by 31, he purchases a lot on front, uh, French Street um, in, uh, uh, in Wilmington, Delaware, and begins to establish a pottery. He quickly sells it uh, in 32 and returns to Philadelphia in 41 and, is, uh, and dies at the ripe age of 73 uh, in 1847. This little picture that you see on the left here is actually in the state collections here. Um, it uh, was excavated in Philadelphia uh, and it's about a one gallon uh, pitcher. So historical archeology span in Branch Green, let's just take a peek at um, on a map here uh, where he is. So we see pre-1799, Cheesequake, New Jersey apprenticeship. This is complete, this is speculation here. Uh, he seems to have a relationship with the Morgan family. It, it, it's fuzzy uh, um, if that there is a Morgan associated with the Troy pottery here, is it the same? Um, so it's, it's a bit of a speculation where he actually apprentices. Um, but we certainly know that by 1799 or sort of uh, turn of the 19th century. He's potting in Troy, New York. And by 1805, he's down in Old Bridge, New Jersey, uh, and he's in uh, operations with uh, uh, Morgan, uh, Van Wickle, and Green, sort of a three, threesome uh, operating that pottery. And by 08, 09, he's certainly in Philadelphia, and like I said, uh, resides here till 27 when he sells, and then is in Wilmington. So I on either side here um, are some speculations uh, are, if they're associated with green. There's two, the two wares on the left the, with the sort of blue dots on them, sort of a stylistic motif that we see showing up again uh, down in Philadelphia. And on the right uh, is a, a picture with a coggle design on it that's um, known to be used uh, in Albany, New York uh, uh, at the Cushman Pottery. Um, Green is not associated with the Cushman pottery, um, but it seems that um, this coggle design uh, shows up uh, down at uh, South River. There's theories as to how um, this transfers this uh, coggle design uh, down um, and uh, continue to, continuing to develop uh, that theory. But um, 
let's keep that coggle uh, in mind as we move on here. So Branch Green in Philadelphia in 1808, he's advertising his business and he's located on North 2nd Street opposite the Globe Mills. Globe Mills is a large uh, mill that's um, there for quite some time. Um, uh, it's pretty much gone now, um, but uh, that's an important landmark uh, to keep in mind. In 1818 and 1819, he's advertising weekly uh, advertisements for his wares, as well as um, um, hydrant, uh, large uh, water fountains for uh, hydrant water. Uh, 1826, uh, newspaper notice uh, of a fire at his um, at his pottery. Quote: So much stoneware was destroyed that the loss must amount to several thousand dollars. Um, and then by 27, uh, there's new owners, uh, Enoch Burnett. Uh, and Henry Remy Jr. The three wares on the left are attributed to Branch Green, uh, classic Branch Green form, bulbous, also, as well as those straight jars, rolled rims uh, on them here. Um, very classic uh, Branch Green. And there's that dot decoration uh, that I showed, similar to those wares that are attributed to the Capital District uh, in New York. Are those Green's wares, those earlier ones? They can't say for certain, but we see that stylistic dash of blue cobalt uh, um, following down here to the wares produced uh, in Philadelphia. So oh, I got a duplicate slide, excuse me. So there are a few marked branch green wares. Um, as in fact, when I was, uh, like I said, I was fairly new here and I only got a quick chance to check the um, collections in the his history side of things, um, but, um, Going back to a published reference, this is a Suzanne uh, Myers' Handcraft Industry, Philadelphia Ceramics in the First Half of the 19th Century. This is available online if you don't have it. You could just Google that and you could get a free download of the PDF. But in fact, this Mark Branch Green, and, and it even says Philadelphia on it, which is super rare, um, helps us associate and attribute. And this particular jug is attributed here to, uh, in the collections of the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission, the William Penn Memorial Museum, the old name for um, our, uh, our, our museum here, the State Museum of Pennsylvania. So um, I haven't located this yet, but I'm looking forward to working with uh, one of my colleagues in the history side to go track this uh, particular jug down. So uh, super rare. Um, piece that is important for making attributions to these unmarked uh, wares um, that we see. Branch, like I said, Branch Green's wares are uh, readily, um, they're around. Uh, they are not um, particularly rare. I would say they're scarce, uh, but they're, uh, he's potted so long that uh, there is a body of surviving uh, wares uh, out there, both in museum collections as well as uh, on the collector market. Um, so here's those cogglings again that I mentioned. This is, this is one of the stylistic attributes that helps identify Branch Green so easily. Um, he's known for um, this um, bird and leaf motif down here, my you could see lower right hand corner. Um, so he's actually using this wheel with this uh, image uh, cut into it. And uh, when the clay is um, sort of leather hard, um, he's running this tool uh, over it. You can also see this fish and berry uh, motif. There's lots of interpretations of this. Obviously Philadelphia being on the Delaware, um, it's quite, there's lots of fish. Um, and lots of spawning uh, going on here uh, in the Delaware. So, but there's that coggling that comes down that we see in Albany, uh, perhaps even into, um, into um, 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 New Jersey, South River, New Jersey. And this type of decoration, this coggling decoration is fairly unique. Um, there, there's others who, who use it, but, um, it, Green seems to use this coggling, particularly the, this, uh, um, this bird motif and this fish motif for quite a long time. So, um, and there's others as well. I've seen uh, leaves, um, sort of a leaf decoration uh, as well with this coggle design. So Branch Green in Philadelphia, um, where, does his pot, where is his pottery? Does it survive today? This is one of the questions that archaeologists often 
just, it's a simple ask. And it's often the very basic question, does it still exist? Um, I will say, I believe it does, that there could be evidence still of the green pottery. About, about 10%, and that's just a general number, about 10% of every kiln firing, every time they pack a kiln full and fire it, about 10% of this material doesn't survive. So there's all, there's always this waster material uh, that uh, is generated. So sort of kiln furniture, things that are used, pieces of clay that are fired uh, with the, the, the wares in there um, are, are discarded as well as any broken vessels that didn't survive the firing process. That primary resource, we've never found, nobody's, to my knowledge, nobody has ever found um, wasters associated directly with the branch green pottery. Um, if they were to be found, it would really help us in understanding what was produced there um, and what hasn't survived, as well as to help make other uh, attributions. So he's, uh, he's located on 2nd Street here um, in the area of uh, uh, the Northern Liberties, uh, right up in this area uh, today, uh, heavily being developed right now. Each time I'm in Philadelphia, I stick my nose uh, in this area and see what uh, if there's anything construction going on. Unfortunately, over COVID, um, I missed some great opportunities right in late 2019. Um, here is Second Street uh, looking sort of southwest here uh, at what was probably the block where the green pottery uh, was located. Um, you can see the construction work going on, land clearing going on here. Um, this area is all built up now with uh, modern uh, multi-use uh, condominiums and, and spaces. And here's another look, um, looking sort of northeast uh, from this point. Um, there is this little patch of grass that still survives today. Um, an, interesting, an interesting area. I don't know if it's been mucked up so bad. Um, but there is opportunity, I believe, still um, for some evidence of greens, uh, pottery, whether it just be uh, wasters or not, uh, to be uh, recovered. The other area of research that I've only begun to scratch the tip of, and that is collections-based research. This is just a sampling, a small sampling of some of the collections held in archaeology. This is actually an image of Delaware. Uh, there's a large project in um, in Wilmington, um, uh, that's one single archaeological project in the city of Wilmington where he potted late in the 1830s uh, here in Philadelphia uh, and in curation here. Um, there is a large collection from the, uh, 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 from the Atwater Kent. It's called the Atwater Kent collection. There may in fact be more uh, green wares in there. And of course, uh, that I-95, digging I-95 project that we talked, I, I, I referenced earlier with the diet um, glass works, um, they have recovered some green wares, uh, branch greens wares uh, as well. So the work continues in the search for branch green. Um, it's collections based. Certainly there's much, much more, I believe, to flesh out of the documentary research uh, on this potter, uh, as well as to continue the diligence uh, for on-site salvage uh, in the area of the pottery. With that, I would like to thank you all for sharing some time today with me. Uh, I'm happy to answer a few questions. And I just wanna recognize uh, some folks here, of course, my PHMC colleagues, Dr. Kurt Miner, uh, good friends and colleagues, Jude Henley, Debbie Miller, Meta Janowitz, Brenda Hornsby Heindel, Tim Bailey, of course, the Zip family, and my wife, Heidi Croft. And especially thank you to all of you uh, for being with me today. Um, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, so much for sharing that information. I appreciated your statement that folks back then are not much different than folks today. So that's a good reminder of how important the study of archaeology is to understanding history. Indeed. So let's get to some questions. What do you think the future of historical archaeology is, especially with the modern shift to digital records? <laughs> oh, good question. Um... I would say that um, 
there is more information out there about each and every one of us than there has ever been uh, in the past. I think that is a good thing and a bad thing uh, in a lot of ways. Um, digital also provides us an opportunity with the digital archiving of uh, written documents um, to be able to access these historic documentations. So I, I, I'm hopeful for the future of historical archaeology, not only learn mining digitized old documents, but also being clever enough to mine uh, the digital footprint that we all leave behind um, in living our everyday lives. Can you explain what stoneware pottery is for those who do not know? Very good. Uh, a basic question that I, I really missed on. Um, stoneware is a type of um, utilitarian wear, utilitarian sort of everyday uh, wear. Um, it is very durable because it is fired at a very high temperature. Uh, you need a particular type of clay to uh, withstand this high, hot temperature. Uh, it burns so hot um, over 2000 degrees. Um, I think it's 20, it's 21 or 2300 degrees um, that it vitrifies. It becomes impervious to water. So it's a, it's a great storage vessel um, for liquids, things that you want to pickle, things you want to sort of um, contain. Uh, it could be dry goods as well, pack fish in as well. Um, it differs from earthenwares, and there's a long tradition of Philadelphia earthenware potters. Uh, that even predates the stoneware. Um, so uh, earthenware is, uh, you can think of a flower pot. Uh, is an earthenware. And when you fill, uh, you water your plant, you can actually see the water sort of seep into uh, that porous earthenware material. Um, there's lots of different uh, food preparation and, and, and food storage wares that are made in earthenware, but you will always find a glaze on the interior, sort of the business side of these objects um, to help make them impervious. So that that's how stoneware and redware differ. One is um, completely impervious to the firing process where the uh, other needs to be glazed. I have a two-part question for you. Sure. How do historical archaeologists share new information about a site or people with the public? And how can amateur archaeologists help preserve the past? Ooh, um, amateur archaeologists can help preserve the past by A, being a voice in your community for archaeology, championing archaeology. Um, the pace of um, development is um, ever, ever gobbling up archaeological resources. And archaeological resources, of course, are non-renewable. Um, once they're gone, they're gone forever. Um, so I would say uh, uh, be diligent in your community. Seek out a chapter of the um, Society for Pennsylvania Archaeology. Uh, there are multiple chapters across the state. Uh, get involved, uh, preserve archaeology, um, be a voice for archaeology in your community. How do we share it with uh, the public? Um, new information, um, webinars like this, uh, it's a great opportunity. Uh, certainly museum interpretation, uh, getting archaeology out in the community, um, involving um, um, young people, exposing young people to, uh, to uh, archaeology and what archaeology could teach us about the past and to sort of foster a um, uh, that the past is important because um, we all stand on the shoulders of, that, of those who came before us. Um, and if we don't have connection with our community um, of a place where we came from or a place where we are, um, we, we sort of lose that. Um, we, we, it's, it's enriching to be a part of something and knowing that you're today's tomorrow's past. You're just, an, you're, you're, you're part of that continuum. Well, we can build on that with the next question of, can you address how science and technology are changing historical archaeological research, the use of geophysics to detect sites, chemistry sure. to analyze materials, and so forth? Sure. Science is uh, ever pushing the boundaries of uh, archaeology and getting wrenching more information out. That's that third base that I talked about. 
Um, there are multiple lines of evidence uh, of uh, evidence gathering technologies today. Um, things like LIDAR and even just drone footage. Um, also, um, so much uh, is being put online. Um, Google Maps, uh, there, a fellow curator here in the department looks at fish weirs um, uh, using Google Maps and how you can penetrate into the waters to see these, uh, these historic and prehistoric uh, features in the waterways. So um, uh, technology will continue to push the boundaries of archeology span to get more information uh, out of the material that we excavate or don't excavate through these non-intrusive methods of archeology. span Can members of the general public view the archeological collections and reports at the State Museum? Are there any public announcements during research projects um, for the public? Uh, sure, if you have a, 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 a research question, um, you could request a particular collections and we will host you here at the archeology span uh, laboratory. Um, section of archaeology, um, you, you would need a, re a, a research question. There is a whole uh, hall of archaeology and anthropology at the State Museum. Uh, historical archaeology is part of that, and our future planning uh, is to help integrate archaeology and history together more. Uh, so you'll be seeing more archaeology uh, here in the museum uh, in the future uh, as well. But um, yeah, there are there are certainly ways to access the collections here. All the collections are held in public trust uh, here at the State Museum. So um, sometimes I hear criticizing that, you know, oh, oh it goes to the museum and you'll, we'll never see it again. All you have to do is ask. Um, we're here to serve the public. Excellent. A couple of specific questions regarding the presentation. Has the early date for Meadowcroft been revised? Ooh. I don't know if I can answer that factually or not. Um, I, I do believe there's some uh, room for interpretation in there. Um, 14,000 years I've heard. Uh, we still publish 16,000. So um, it's really pushing, it's an early date. Um, it, it really is. Uh, I do know that there's some real analysis going on from another rock shelter site uh, here uh, by the folks at um, Penn State, Penn State, Penn State, um, looking at uh, sheep rock shelter, uh, particularly organic materials from there uh, and dating uh, that material. So uh, I, unfortunately, I can't answer that one 100% that question. Is there a connection between historical stoneware potteries and the location where the clay source is? Absolutely. Um, the earliest stoneware potteries uh, in the country are associated uh, around those clay banks. It's mostly around, um, uh, it's in New Jersey, sort of uh, the Amboy region of New Jersey. There's outcroppings on, uh, I believe, Long Island, uh, which helps feed the uh, the Connecticut potteries. So absolutely, those um, that those stoneware clays um, the first potteries are located very close to those stone, those stoneware, uh, uh, that, that, that clay resource. Uh, as you move on, uh, 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 more recently, they begin to ship that material. You see it going up the Hudson. Um, you see it coming down into uh, the mid-Atlantic. So um, yes, they begin to move that clay around. Would you be able to identify Branch Green's stoneware without the distinctive cockle design if you found an undecorated shard? Is there anything specific you would look for? A single shard might not do it, but if you have a, you know, 20% of a vessel, 30%, uh, 40%, sure. Uh, oftentimes we'll find a bunch of broken pieces and we put them all back together, often just uh, to begin with, with tape. Um, that little picture I showed was all held together with, <laughs> with tape um, for the photographs. Um, yeah, uh, greens wares change over time as any artisan. There's certainly other artisans working with him. He has several sons. Uh, we don't know the names of those artisans. There must be apprentices as well. We see a lot of wares that are sort of green-like. Uh, we attribute them to sort of being green-like. Um, you know, we'll never really know. Um, it is, um, 
but yeah, you, you sort of get a feel for Branch Green's wares, how he fires his kill. You, there's often these um, particular scars on um, uh, uh, Green's wares. I, I think he reduces, uh, starves the oxygen in his uh, kiln, sort of brings out these colors, these dark, these dark blackish and red colors uh, in there. Sometimes he'll even um, dip his wares in a, an iron glaze that sort of fires this really dark brick red. Uh, color. So, um, yes, there's ways um, to distinguish uh, greens wares from fragments, um, particularly handles and rims. Take a couple last questions. Uh, what primary documents for you personally have proven most helpful in your research? Oh, um, you know, uh, I haven't delved deep. I'll be quite frank with everybody. Um, I hope to, uh, being here in Pennsylvania may allow me that our state archives is just around the corner. Um, you know, the newspapers are a tremendous um, resource. Um, and uh, the newspaper really tells you what's happening in your community, uh, whether it's t today, well, we read newspapers online now, um, but uh, it, it, in the 19th century, uh, the, the newspaper was a very important means of communication and sharing information and, of course, advertising. Um, green shows up a lot uh, in the newspapers. Um, so that sort of begins the, that begins the paper, the, that begins the, the document search. There's got to be other documents out there, uh, property taxes, um, um, uh, uh, land deeds. Uh, if, if there's ever a court case, I'm sure it's out there. I'm sure there's apprentice records. Um, we just got to go look for them. And that's that, that gets back to that idea again of that simple question, is it still there? Um, that basic question in archaeology. Well, we should just go look. <laughs> so I hope to go look. Uh, and if anybody wants to assist me in that look, I am open to uh, assistance. <laughs> so are there any specific examples you can share from your own research where newly excavated or recovered archaeological material, material qualified what had been known through other historical evidence? Um, yes. <laughs> uh, um, I think we're going to uh, need to do another another program, Paul. Okay. I, I uh, you know, there's I that uh, it's funny. I you know that question makes me think of uh, Jim Dietz, who was a famous uh, archaeologist, um, historical archaeologist, and um, Jim once wrote, um, you know. Um, uh, how does it go? Something along the lines like historical archaeology is the most expensive way to, um, you, you know, know what the historians already know. <laughs> In other words, it's sort of that base hit that I was talking about. It's, um, you know, sometimes uh, archaeology, um, we don't learn something new. Um, but sometimes you just need to ask better questions or to look at your collections better. And sometimes when you go out and look, it's just not there. Fort Hunter, as a matter of fact, um, there's been a lot of archaeology at Fort Hunter. They found material from the period of Fort Hunter, but they've never found Fort Hunter. Um, it's it's thought that it's underneath the the large stone mansion that's there now. Um, but yeah, sometimes uh, sometimes things don't work out the way you hope them. Uh, but that's the nature of uh, you know any scientific inquiry. Uh, you try, uh, and that's the important part. I want to thank everyone in the audience for your questions. Paul, what would you like the audience to remember from today's program? Um, uh, archaeological resources are non-renewable. They're irreplaceable. Um, so um, we all need to be caring for them uh, one way. Uh, it, it's our collective past. Uh, and um, once it's gone, it's gone. And also, if we do get information, we should freely share that information amongst colleagues and the public. Um, to hold on to information is un starves us all uh, of the most important thing, which is knowledge and understanding. Thank you, Paul, for being part of this program today. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. So we're going to ask the audience to please join us again for more Learn at Lunchtime programs. Visit the State Museum's website at statemuseumpa.org for program information and to sign up.